I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. I'm in a really good mood because it's been so successful, starting with sun gazing uh, this morning at dawn, which is like anytime I do that, I'm so high on life all day. But I also got uh, my shipment of uh, decaf weed today. Okay, so <laughs> sun gazing free. sun gazing is like just looking at the sun, right? Or watching well, it come up. Sun gazing is uh, either done at dawn or dusk, or ideally both if you're so situated geographically. Uh, the idea there is you're, you are actually, uh, and by the way, kids don't try this at home. It's something you definitely want to do right because you can harm your eyes if there's too much uh, UV light in the sun. But typically, depending on where you are in proximity to the horizon, meaning if there's a bunch of mountains in between you and the sunrise, then there's going to be too much UV in that light by the time it hits you, it's if it's coming over a mountain. But let's just say you're in the desert on a flat plain. And when you see the sun coming uh, on the horizon, there's nothing in the way. So you're getting that really red spectrum of light. And I do, in fact, like look directly at it for the first 10 minutes or so. And then you start to move your gaze downward toward the lower part of the horizon, 20, 40, 60, 80 degrees, whatever um, is suitable depending on how bright the sun is because you don't want to look directly at the sun once it's got a bunch of UV in it. Uh, But, you know, this is an ancient human practice, definitely documented in the Ayurvedic system, uh, calling it sun gazing. And uh, when I do it, I'm telling you, man, I just have the best days because it makes your dopamine go crazy all day long. You have really high dopamine uh, and also um, it starts producing cortisol right when you do it. So it wakes you up and then that cortisol signals your melatonin to start being produced when the sun goes down. So it's like the fastest way you can change your circadian rhythm. It's also the fastest and most effective jet lag hack in the world hands down. Wow. I, I've never done it that officially, and I'd like to challenge everyone listening to go and do that tomorrow morning, just as Luke described, and see what happens. Let's do it one time, see what happens. And if you add breath work to it, because why not? You're sitting there anyway. Uh, and if you do it, you want to do it grounded, also electrically grounded, so bare feet or your finger touching a tree or something of that nature. Um, for a number of different reasons. But the combination of breath work being grounded and watching the sunset and or sunrise will change your freaking life. And if you have depression or anxiety, that would hands down be my number one recommendation to treat it before you try anything else. Wow. Thank you for that. I can't, yes. I'm going to try it. I live at the beach. So it's the sun is more uh, facing me at, at the sunset. But um, I think I can figure out a way to catch it in the morning too. I'm going to try that. I'm excited. I have watched the sunrise from Venice Beach. As long as you're in a beach that has some depth to the sand, like this wouldn't work in Malibu where the mountains are in the way and the the sandbar is really short. But like in Venice and Santa Monica, we have this super wide sandbar that allows you to walk way out toward the water. You can actually get a pretty good view of the sunrise from there as well. Yeah. Killer. What weed are you smoking on? Um, well, you know, Jackie, I technically don't smoke weed. That's the funniest thing talking to you because I know you're you're such a lover of cannabis. But uh, recently I was in Colorado sitting in a hot spring, as you do, hopefully when visiting Colorado. And I saw this guy smoking a spliff. And I'm sober, you know, 23 years. I had a lot of issues with addiction in my adolescence and youth into my 20s, got sober, never going back, loved that sober life. However, I did used to love me some weed. And uh, if there's any drug that I miss, just in terms of the ritual of just smoking and coughing and the flavor and all that, it's probably weed. So this dude's smoking a joint and then I overhear him say, oh yeah, this is this new cannabis um, strain that they've bred the THC out of and it's just a CBD joint. And it smelled like the most chronic ass weed ever. And I'm like, dude, did I just hear you say you're smoking that joint and it doesn't get you high? He's like, oh yeah, I hate getting high. It makes me paranoid. Like I will never smoke weed, never have. I hate it. Uh, And he said, but these are straight CBD with you know, 0.003 
THC or whatever, negligible amount of THC. And so, you know, having been convinced that I was safe to do so, I took a couple of hits off it and felt not high at all, but incredibly relaxed and chill. And then I found out later that when you smoke CBD, uh, it saturates you uh, much deeper than if you were to eat a CBD product like some oil or something like that. And the bioavailability is much higher when you smoke it because it goes right into the capillaries in your lungs. So forgot about that, came back. And then the place that I order Kratom from sometimes for back pain just happened to have pre-rolled spliffs of TH-free CBD weed. Um, do you recall the brand name? Um, shit, yeah. Let me look up the website right here. Only because I'm pretty sure that's uh, our product. I'm pretty sure you're smoking. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure you're smoking our weed, which is amazing. You might not be. There might be another brand already. But uh, Matt, my husband, is partnered with um, a couple of friends of his in the cannabis space to do hemp pre-rolls. Um, wow. Yeah. And they're like, they're going off the shelves. They, It's a beautiful quality flower too. So you get the weed smoking experience with a much less of a high, as you've described. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I- I'm going to have to send you the site for your show notes because I I don't remember the name of it right offhand. So no worries. Gonna... We'll just pretend that it's mine or that it's <laughs> my family's. And uh, and what a small world. Amazing. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying it. And um, yeah, man, I was having... We're figuring out new ways to smoke cannabis without getting that giant punch of THC which at certain levels tends to make some people feel paranoid. But like I always say, the weed didn't make you paranoid. You are paranoid and the weed showed you that. But of course, that's not a fun place to be. And also we forget, especially in California, that it's totally cool to smoke like half a hit of a THC joint, which is which is how I consume it, which is microdose weed. It's not really a conversation that we had during the green rush while we were rushing to get it on shelves, but you can totally microdose weed guys. That's that's funny. I never thought of that. I mean, the reason that I don't smoke psychoactive weed, um, and by the way, anyone who's considers themselves sober and sees me or smoking a split probably thinks I'm nuts. (laughs) (laughs) It'll totally be a very unorthodox approach. Wait till Uh, I tell you what we've got coming around the corner, but I'll save that for another show. Well, what happened for me historically, and there's only one way to find out if this would in fact be the case today, 23 years later, but when I was really struggling with addiction issues in my past, doing the hard street drugs, et cetera, um, I could never get off them fully because I was never willing to quit smoking weed. And Mm. I, I found this chain reaction of a gateway drug sort of phenomenon where if I smoked weed, it would activate this phenomenon of craving. And then I would want to drink alcohol and then I have a few beers and the next thing you know, I'm drunk. And if I was drunk, then Coke didn't sound like that bad of an idea. And then, (laughs) and so on and so on. Um, We just went further down the scale of drug quality from there. So eventually I had to concede to myself that I did not have the willpower to just smoke weed recreationally. Not to mention when I smoked weed, I did it 24 seven macro macro dose and was totally dysfunctional. I was never able to do what you just described historically. So I've never smoked weed psychoactively in all of these years because I don't want to set into affect that chain reaction of addiction and the inability to control myself with other substances, alcohol included. Nor do I want to just become like a full on dysfunctional stoner like I was before. So I'm just kind of like erring on the side of caution. And I just say I don't do THC, at least in, in um, you know, amounts that would be make me can feel high. You know what I mean? That's super um, but, fair. But I am celebrating uh, the CBD uh, spliff because I really love the flavor and I just love smoking things. Um, and I don't think I'll get addicted to it. And I absolutely feel stone cold sober as I'm on my second one of the day. And it just tastes delicious. And it's an amazing plant, probably not great for my lungs, but to me worth the hit. Well, and smoking is an act of ceremony. Um, and we can forget about that portion of it too. And ceremony, and we'll get into this, I'm sure is such a huge part of the psychedelic world and the plant medicine world. And um, so let's get into that because when I I knew about you through Bulletproof, my days as an early biohacker or novice biohacker, 
and then through our mutual friend, Daniel Vitalis. And then I remember, you know, the last time we hung out, you came up to the High Times um, rooftop deck over on Wilshire. Oh, yeah, right. And we're sort of telling me your story about being sober. And I, I was like, and, and here's where I'm at with that sober and psychedelics. My my biological father was now he died of alcoholism. And so I totally understand like the sober world and it's been a part of my family. And there's, of course, other things that you can be sober from. I'm currently trying to get off sugar. Um, so hopefully one day I'll be sober from sugar. But going, you know, and I have 22 years of uh, personal of a personal relationship with psychedelic substances. Um, and I guess I just never really delved into it, but it, I, I thought, well, of course, somebody who's a recovering alcoholic or recovering from opioids or, or heroin, of course, they're not going to do psychedelics or plant medicine because they're all one and the same, which is uh, pretty naive of me um, in hindsight. But it, I'm around a lot of people who explore the plant medicine realm especially when it comes to Ibogaine um, as recovering heroin addicts. There's a ton of recovering heroin addicts and alcoholics in the plant medicine world. So tell me about your journey from sober into the plant medicine realm. So great. Such a an awesome development in the story of recovery, I think, and one that's going to requires some careful careful and thoughtful articulation on my behalf because the path that I originally set out on uh, that was finally successful in my many attempts to rid myself of the bondage that I'd previously found myself so entrapped was complete abstinence. And so when I was 26 years old, couldn't get off heroin, couldn't get off crack, did crystal meth, even though I hated it. And not to say that crack was a party, but there was at least 30 seconds of pleasure. Right. <laughs> Whereas like crystal meth was just all downhill 100%. Um, and I talk about these things in kind of a flippant way. I don't mean to make, make light of them. There was a time when I was kind of ashamed about this part of my life and didn't share it publicly. And then as I sort of came out about my recovery and my past, I talked about it in a very ambiguous, vague way and just said, I did hard drugs. And now it's like, I think my intention is what's going to help the most amount of people. And so if someone's listening and they're addicted to heroin and I'm like, oh, I used to do drugs and then I quit. They're like, yeah, right. Yeah. What, what were you doing? You know, but to say like, wow, I was on the most ostensibly one of, if not the most addictive substances on earth, or at least a substrate of it uh, being an opiate, um, having survived that and lived to tell the tale, uh, I am very respectful of the path of abstinence and I would, Actually, if someone was new in their recovery, I would highly discourage you going online and ordering some CBD joints. Uh, I would not <laughs> drink like, you know, the kombucha I'm drinking would be questionable for some newcomers <laughs> in recovery. Uh, when I was new, I used to drink near beer, you know, and everyone in AA and stuff told me I was going to fuck near you. beer? Just a low. I, well, it's just non-alcoholic beer. Okay. You know, it's, and again, I wouldn't recommend that for an alcoholic that's trying to get sober. It's like, why would you you know, it's like, if you're trying to get off porn, why would you put on an R rated movie? You know what I mean? Just like, let's just avoid the whole thing. So the path for me for the first 22 years and the one that has led to my current state of usefulness in society and my sense of well being and self worth was the path of 100% abstinence. So for 22 years, I was deeply involved in applying the 12 steps to my life in living a life of service, a life of dedicated prayer, devotion, uh, etc. And, um, you know, studying all the different paths of meditation and yoga and doing everything I can to like get myself in touch with God and stay there. And I've been able to do that in an, uh, an, a multitude of ways. However, in order for me to stay sober, initially for the, you know, initially being 22 years long, there was no messing around. So I didn't do anything except uh, caffeine and nicotine. Those are the only two mind altering substances I did that whole time with the exception of, you know, having a surgery and doing Vicodin or something as a result. And um, that's what enabled me to really start to work on the underlying 
causes and conditions of you know early trauma and just painful ways of experiencing my life in this body emotionally and mentally uh, that necessitated the drinking and using to the degree with which I was committed to it. So it's like quitting drugs and alcohol doesn't really do much for you except stop the bleeding right in the moment, but it doesn't remove the cut. So it's just jacks for openers. It's like the physical abstinence and sobriety is just the first thing you do so that you can clear the channel and find ways to live a life in connection with a higher power that then enables you to start seeing the things within you that need to be healed at the core level that caused you to be in enough pain to make your life that of a drug addict or alcoholic. So getting sober to me is like the first step. Then you really start working on the mindset and the mental and emotional part. And that's what I did for 22 years. And I would hear of people periodically, um, peers of mine, people in the media, et cetera, talk about uh, the fact that they had gotten sober, not by going to rehab and going to meetings and taking the long, slow route that I did at 26, but people that had gone off and did, as you mentioned, um, uh, Iboga or ayahuasca or different uh, plant medicines and been struck sober or even just struck clear of whatever kind of emotional baggage they were being encumbered by in their life and went on to be forever free and never did any kind of a program or read any books about it or anything. And I started to meet some of these people through my podcast, The Lifestylist, and just out in the world. And I mean, I sat eye to eye with a few people, uh, one guy in particular who had been um, an IV Dilaudid user for many years, couldn't get off it, went to a shrink for eight years, went to like 20 something rehabs, couldn't get more than a few days sober and went and did um, Iboga one time and was sober for years after that and still is. Um, and also solved a lot of the underlying character issues that he was walking around with too, you know, because that's the thing when you sell your soul to drugs and alcohol, um, the the moral degradation that many of us experience is part and parcel to that lifestyle because now you've got to hide, you have to lie, uh, eventually you may shame. have to steal. Yeah, it's the shame, it's the selling your body, it's you know, it's selling yourself out, it's it's all of these behavioral, this selfish, narcissistic, just hardcore self centeredness that is. Um, that is comes along with a life of addiction. And so when you get sober, you know, first, as I said, you get sober, then you work on all that shit, your character defects, et cetera. Uh, but people doing plant medicines reported to me that all of that was done in one fell swoop. <laughs> and it seemed to be abundantly clear that that was the case based on my energy reading of them in these conversations. So that piqued my interest. Um, and then I also started to meet people that had gone off and done ayahuasca and really healed a lot of their underlying trauma. People that were already sober and came back and remained sober. They didn't go off and do ayahuasca in Peru and come back and be like, you know what, I should do some blow. <laughs> to the contrary, they're coming back going, wow, I'm going to actually get even more conscious and more spiritual and more healthy and even release some of the more subtle addictions such as device addiction and nail biting and sugar, as you mentioned, and some of the ones that are on the surface uh, less destructive or at least uh, nonetheless um, uh, less visible, you know? So, so at that point, and then, you know, kind of let you take it where you want to take it next. But uh, 22 years is how long it took me to get to the point where I thought, okay, do I trust myself? Do I trust my motives? Do I trust the set and setting? Uh, of this experience that's now starting to come into my life as an option more often. And once I was able to reconcile within myself that um, it was something that would be beneficial to me and something that I could do safely without regressing into my old ways, I went off to Costa Rica and did uh, ayahuasca for four nights. And it was the best thing, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my entire life. And I would say out of all of the things I've done to support my recovery and sobriety, with the exception of just, you know, the traditional going to rehab and getting my ass to meetings, et cetera, um, was that experience. It was just profoundly transformational and healing on every level. And when I came back, the last thing I wanted to do was go to a bar. How many years ago now was that? That would have been in the, um, let's see, that would have been in... The beginning of, uh, yeah, December, no wait, January 2019 would have been my first trip to Costa Rica, which was to Rhythmia, then in um, 
um, December 2019, 11 months later, I went and did another four ceremonies at Soltara, right. uh, also also in Costa Rica. Yeah. And, and look, I don't want to embarrass you at all, but as a, yeah. as a from a producer standpoint or just like an onlooker's curatorial standpoint, you have blossomed in a way in the light, you know, before that time, but really like it's now that I know the date since that experience, like really like catapulted yourself and your message and what and what you're putting out there in a way that, yeah, makes sense to me as a psychedelic um, enthusiast that it would be something like ayahuasca um, to help help you catapult yourself in that way. So it's it's been amazing. And and that story is reminiscent of so many other people as well who were stuck or not even stuck. I mean, a lot of people who had figured out before ayahuasca um, go and then they reach another level. It's like a video game, right? It's like you think you won and then, <laughs> oh shit, yeah. no, there's like I unlocked a special world. Um, yeah. So I just want to say that it's been it's been really beautiful to watch. Thank you. Yeah, it's the, it's the Mario Brothers, uh, you know, of consciousness. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> beep, funny because <laughs> yeah, oh. going up that little ladder, you know, uh, Donkey. No, Donkey Kong. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, oh, even man. the precursor. Um, but anyway, yeah, you know, the funny thing about that experience was. As I said, here I am, 22 years sober, very respectful of the gift that's been bestowed upon me. I know that it was nothing short of the grace of God that entered into my life and allowed me to become free of my addictions. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. I don't, you know, I could be an ardent atheist or agnostic and still I would give the same account. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't necessarily believe in it, but I know that this happened, you know? And so I'm very respectful of that. And when I went to Costa Rica and did ayahuasca, I will never forget the first night of ceremony and sitting on my mat. I'm like, this is your fucking moment, Luke. Like, you're going to do this shit or what? Like, is this is getting real because I'm watching everyone go up and drink their little shot glasses. I'm like, holy shit, am I about to do this? And, you know, I was like in my heart, I felt really good about it. I was very clear. I felt very safe. I knew what I was doing. I trusted myself and I went and had that first cup. And for anyone that's taken that medicine, you know, generally speaking in ceremony, you're going to have one or more cups. And the first one's kind of just... To me, it was an introduction of that substance, that essence of that uh, plant's intelligence into my system. Sat there for maybe an hour, you know, um, used various forms of tobacco and just meditated. Didn't really feel anything other than relax. And then I was like, here we go, second cup. Went up for that second cup, went. And I remember just making myself as present as a statue. I just sat on my mat feeling, you know, very clear, very sober, very present. And I just wanted to wait for that first molecule to go bing. <laughs> you know, because I never I wanted to savor that moment of like, all right, I've been one way for 22 years and I'm just lifting the veil into another dimension that I've probably never even been to in my prior experiences with LSD and mushrooms when I was younger because I was so unintentional about it. Yeah. So I'm waiting for that moment. And you know, you know how it is. All of a sudden, you know, here comes the uh, you know the grid starts laying out, and I'm going, oh shit, we are not in Kansas anymore, folks. Uh, we're off the deep end for real. And um, and I remember that experience, and and just being so free because I knew that another element of nature was being opened up to me and that I didn't have to live in the restrictions and the confines that I thought I once did in terms of these are the these are the rules for a sober person or the rules for a sober Luke. And there is no stepping out of bounds with that. And once I did, and it was a celebration of a newfound freedom to be able to explore other dimensions of consciousness and other means by which to heal oneself, to become more whole, to connect to consciousness, etc. But it was also like, it was a big fuck yeah, man. Good job, dude. Yeah. That, <laughs> that I was able to get to a place of trust within myself and having a sense of autonomy and being respectful of the gift I've been given, but also a bit of freedom and not having to answer to, you know, a group of my peers or having an old, 
you know, sponsor's voice in my head and being like, dog, you're not sober anymore. Change your sobriety date. And just all of the attachments to this structure, which was so necessary for so long, but the attachments to the structure and this belief system and this, you know, sort of rigid way of operating within the world. So it was like, it was such a liberating first few moments. And, and I always say, I have to be totally honest. It was hella fun too. Yeah. I mean, I'm just like tripping balls. I just got hit by a locomotive, you know, and it was just like God going like, oh, you want to see something? Watch this, you know, and just my entire reality was just completely dismantled in front of me in the best way. And I'll close with that experience by saying the words that came to me in that moment or shortly after were, because I kind of asked myself, I think, am I, am I still sober? And this sort of voice or or more of a realization within said, Luke, you have never been this sober in your entire life. Mm. And what I took that to mean and how I've unpacked that is that many of us walk around in a waking state that would be considered technically speaking and based on a blood test or a P test that you are sober. However, how many of us are really sober in terms of how active our monkey mind is and how how much we lack or possess the ability to stay within the present moment truly on a consistent basis. How sober are we from the confines of the ego and the physical sensations and emotions that arise as a result of its being threatened constantly by its environment and wanting to seek a position in its environment and all of those things that are part of our our physical, physiological, psychological, emotional, and spiritual makeup. And so in that moment, this this (laughs) sheer and pure sobriety was being momentarily and temporarily unencumbered by the Luke personality, by the human experience, by my body, by the limitations put in place by my nervous system and by my senses that keep me within this very narrow bandwidth of experience. So that bandwidth is expanded. And to me, not that one can live there all the time because it's not the point of human incarnation. You're supposed to live in that bandwidth so that you can learn what's inherent to that bandwidth. But for a moment to have that suspended, well, for you know six hours or whatever it was, was truly one of the most sobering experiences of my life because I got to exist in a place of consciousness without being drunk on my humanness. Wow. Oh, I love that concept of reevaluating the definition of sober um, and how we use that in our language. And yeah, it goes without saying that the sort of draconian way of organizing, um, you know, people with addiction or post addiction, like that has its purpose in the same way that, you know, there's a million ways to do something. Um, and the wonderful thing about psychedelics is that they create ideas um, and pathways to solve solve problems with new solutions. And we're like, we're in the world right now, right? Where we're forced to evaluate our own sobriety. And I I can't help but think of early in my Delic branding exercise, um, I had originally thought, okay, well, maybe my message is that the goal is sober and that psychedelics are a pathway to get you there. And I was in the midst of a ketamine uh, prescribed ketamine journey at my doctor's and the woman who was um, facilitating it, I think I said something to that nature. It's hard for me to exactly remember. And she started talking about sobriety in a way that made me rethink that. Like, what is sobriety? And it's different to every person um, outside of the medical system. And also though, as a species, we've looked for ways to alter our mind states for thousands and thousands of years. It's part of our makeup to, like you said, uh, expand our bandwidth so we can gain the perspective to see how to live within that bandwidth and to do both. Like that's the beauty of being human. Um, and when done with, when done thoughtfully and with reverence, you know, can be safe, is safe. Yeah, I think that it's um, 
It's a delicate issue because the scaffolding that is necessary for most people in the traditional model of recovery is abstinence. And the reason why that is the case is because based on historical data of failure and success rates, the most successful methodology to maintain sobriety if you're a drug addict or an alcoholic is complete abstinence off anything that dramatically changes the way you feel or has any potential for intoxication uh, or subsequently addiction. However, (laughs) going back into the history of traditional recovery, specifically in the life of Bill Wilson, who was the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, arguably the most influential movement, uh, spiritual movement, even I might go so far as to say, definitely movement in terms of temperance or sobriety uh, in you know recorded history. Uh, the guy that you know was downloaded these 12 steps in the initial literature and co-founded with this other guy, um, is is known that at the uh, end of his life, which would have put him in the in the 20s of his sobriety, you know, 23, 25 years sober, I believe, when he died, and I, I think it was the early to mid 60s when he passed away of emphysema, by the way, from smoking cigarettes because he could never get abstinence from cigarettes. Uh, but it's widely um, known that Bill Wilson um, understood that the foundation of his initial recovery or initial sobriety then on into his recovery in general was based on a spiritual experience and a connection to God. Having a felt sense that there is a God that you can connect to and rely on that can keep you um, in a state of balance and homeostasis that makes it unnecessary to to then anesthetize yourself with drugs or alcohol. And so he knew the spiritual experience was the missing link and the AA groups and the 12 steps whole purpose is to cause and induce a spiritual experience in the member's life, which results in them not having the need or want to go drink alcohol. And once that spiritual experience has so ensued for that member, uh, it's incumbent upon their own recovery an own sense of well-being that they then share that model. And that's how that model carries on. It's like, you don't do anything, it works, you connect to God because there's nothing interfering with that connection. And then you share that methodology with someone else who's newer at it than you are. And that sense of being of service is inherently something that builds one's self-worth and self-esteem and spiritual energy uh, due to the nature of the power of unconditional love to the point that they never hopefully regress and go back to that life. So Bill Wilson knew that was the model. He communicated through letters with um, Carl Jung, who indicated in his clinical experience that he had a very, very low success rate in treating alcoholics because he didn't know how to induce a spiritual experience, which is what Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob eventually figured out by these AA groups, okay? So Carl Jung couldn't really help most of his patients. I mean, Carl Jung, if he fails on you as an alcoholic, you're pretty much screwed, right? But he did understand that these, uh, when it did happen, it wasn't because of his work. They were based on these conversion experiences or religious experiences in which someone has direct conscious contact with God. So fast forward to many years of Bill Wilson's sobriety toward the end of his life, he wanted to find a way to help induce that spiritual experience at wholesale without having people have to spend years and years going to these groups and taking sort of the slow and steady route. So he started to, um, through relationship with either Aldous Huxley directly or indirectly, started experimenting with LSD, not as an escape from his problems, but as a way to get in and find that spiritual connection uh, in hopes that that would be a way he could overcome his lifelong depression, which continued into his physical sobriety for many years and also help other alcoholics to recover more quickly. And so here you have the guy that's the co-founder of the recovery movement, essentially, the model that most people follow today, uh, that at one point had the curiosity and the wisdom to try to seek this experience through psychedelics. Shortly after that, as we know, LSD became illegal and went underground. And so the clinical use and psychiatric use of LSD was, you know, tamped down for that moment. And now, of course, as you know, we'll probably see a resurgence of that in the coming years. But just in context of AA, one could say Bill Wilson, the co-founder, did not die sober. If you count using LSD in a therapeutic clinical setting as a slip. Yeah. So it gets really interesting when you start to look at all the different sides of this. Thank you for pointing that out. I don't think most people realize that about AA or Bill Wilson. And it's important to make that connection. And I honestly, there aren't a lot of studies being done on 
with LSD and how to treat psychiatric conditions. Uh, Switzerland pretty much takes the cake uh, when it comes to that. But I think with the resurgence of um, what MAPS is doing using MDMA in their stage three trial to effectively induce a godlike experience to get quicker to people's trauma. Uh, I hope that LSD comes quickly behind as, as, as it is um, one of my favorite substances to use to understand myself better in the world around me. Yeah, I've not done LSD uh, consciously ever, although I am a big fan of uh, generally twice a week doing a very, very tiny microdose of it as a nootropic. And I, I have to say it's probably out of all nootropic-like substances, it's probably my very favorite one. Wow. Okay, so before I want to talk about style philosophy, but before that, so let's talk about LSD microdosing and your personal experience with it. And that makes sense to me because... For those of you who don't know, I'm sure most people listening do, but LSD was found as a result of chemists looking for drugs to treat blood circulation. And that makes a lot of sense because the sensations that you feel when you take a certain amount, and I think even with microdosing, is like sort of a, an increase in energy. It's like extremely energetic. And that's where it can be dangerous or um, troublesome if you're not in the right set and setting or with the right person who knows how to help you uh, harness that energy. But um, that would make sense in a microdose setting that it would be one of your favorites or one of the most useful for people. I know the tech space is really into LSD microdosing as well. Well, it's it's not you know something that I would have discovered on my own likely. Um, and I have not taken a psychoactive dose of LSD in in my sobriety in recent years that was you know i used to go to a lot of dead shows back in the early 90s and i did copious amounts of acid there i actually started doing it in high school i remember the first time i did it i was in home at class and um <laughs> i remember some really interesting tupperware wow experiences yeah um <laughs> but that would have been like 16 years old 1986 or something i started doing acid and did it for many years just yeah. you know to escape essentially and have fun but to, to be honest, now out of all of them, maybe maybe iboga might be in the same category, but acid kind of scares the shit out of me, yeah, just because it it's should. so aggressive, you know. Like it's ayahuasca, very effective. <laughs> ayahuasca has waves, you know. It's like it can be euphoric. You can kind of take a nap. It sort of comes in and out. You get a little reprieve sometimes. You go to the bathroom. You kind of come out of it. You think you're cool. You come back and lay down and you're mad, and it takes you on another journey. But it's it's so sort of flu fluid. Uh, in its effect, but from what I remember of taking, you know, a psychoactive dose of acid, it's like boom, you're tripping, <laughs> and there's like there's no escape from that, no reprieve until it eventually starts to to wane and subside just throughout, you know, from it kind of, um, you know, standing, it, running its uh, test, the test of time it was meant to run that day. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, with the microdosing, I, I would have never really done it had I not been uh, turned on to it by a really brilliant man by the name of Dr. Ted Achacoso, who's been a guest on my podcast. And he's ostensibly one of the eight highest IQs on planet Earth. He's a really, really smart guy. And why I say ostensibly is there's no way to prove it. But when he was a bit younger, he was one of the four highest recorded IQs on the planet, but now there's more people. So he hypothesized that he could possibly, and not in a, you know, like, you know, uh, in an arrogant way at all, but he's just speaking mathematically. Way, yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's likely one of the eight or 10 most smart people, at least that type of intelligence on the planet. He broke down the whole science of how microdosing LSD works, which I have no idea how to repeat, but it left me convinced enough that this is worth a shot for the following reason. When he came over uh, and recorded, he had some with him and he had taken it. And I'm like, this guy is able to access. I mean, granted, he's got a really high IQ. He's very intelligent, but he's also so warm and spiritual and like was able to access this amazing emotional intelligence and 
empathy. And then when he went on to explain the effects of especially prolonged and irregular uh, microdoses of LSD, that it allows your brain, maybe through the course of, um, of a mechanism that you just described as the circulation piece, but it allows your brain to oscillate between analytical and creative very easily. And for me, when I'm sitting down to do work, most of my work requires that skill and I find it difficult because I get into like analytical, get the list done mode, like organize the files, move this MP3 here and do the data yeah. card thing. That's a totally different brain for me than having a conversation like this that's heartfelt and creative or doing some writing or conceptualizing an idea, etc. And the microdosing of LSD gives me this mental energy that's just insane and it allows me to oscillate between those two modes of action just seamlessly all day long. And it's incredible. There's nothing else I know that does that. Yeah. So that's why I do it. But Ted recommended only do it twice a week. I forget why, but I trusted his judgment. And so um, after well, I'll direct he- people in the show notes to the to that episode because that sounds really cool. fruitful. Yeah, it's called like the LSD MD and something, something. But he- <laughs> He's dope. He's a really, just a really interesting person anyway. So after I did that show, someone hit me up on Insta and was like, hey, I heard you talking about wanting to microdose LSD, but you didn't have any. He said, I might know a guy. (laughs) And um, so, you know, I connected with a gentleman and he also makes these amazing microdose tinctures with psilocybin that he grows in a lab. And he's up to some really good stuff, but he basically had a bottle of liquid LSD laying around that he wasn't going to use. And he gave it to me and it's it's probably like five lifetimes worth if you microdose. Because one drop is five micrograms or yeah. one twentieth of a hit, right? So a little vial, one drop at a time is going to last a very long time. And I never, I never fuck around with that one. I just do the one drop. Yeah, and that's what's challenging about LSD is, is that it's so potent and that in its rawest form is liquid. And um, to dose it properly, you have to like do work. You have to understand what you're doing. You, but it's also hard to separate liquid um, in a way to dose properly. And so people lay it on blotter paper. They lay it on other things. I I think blotter paper is, while cute for marketing and cultural purposes, is awful in terms of a methodology to consume LSD because then you're getting everything that comes along with that blotter paper. And sometimes there's formaldehyde and really funky shit on the stuff that you and I took when we were younger. Um, But there's also, because it's a lab science, if you will, there's not a lot of built-in ceremony. Um, Maybe somewhat these days in certain parts of Topanga Canyon. Uh, But on the big (laughs) scale, culturally, we haven't come up with a real ceremony around it. And I think, I hope that that happens um, because the more we can do that and like be mindful and have reverence for it, um, the I think the better we'll be that's, in that particular that's, way. That's a great distinction. And perhaps that's why it hasn't been something that I've been really guided to experiment with on that level of doing an actual journey. Because I, I think, what am I going to do? Just sit in the house and obsess on my phone like I usually do at night? You know no, I mean? you're like, going to go outside. I hope. I hope. I hope you're going to go outside. So, yeah, I guess that's why I haven't. Whereas um, even with, with psilocybin, uh, although I haven't, you know, again, done that recreationally in many, many years, I did have an opportunity that came into my awareness recently to work one-on-one with the local healer. And um, he works with psilocybin and MDMA. And so you do one hit of really super clean MDMA. Uh, after about an hour, you eat you know anywhere from three to 10 grams of mushrooms. I think I did like three and a half to start with. And it was amazing. Yeah. I had yeah. in- incredible healings take place. I mean, realizations, the name of a book, the cover of the book, this whole other thing. I mean, all these creative downloads, um, a healing, a spontaneous healing in my body. These energetic kundalini surges started to overcome me and do all kinds of magic in my body. And it was very similar to ayahuasca in its in its effect and the, in the, in the level of realization that it allowed me to have. Um, but I didn't feel sick at all. And when it wore off, it wore off really quickly and I felt amazing afterward. Um, so... 
thinking about something like LSD, doing it with a guide that has a, a method and sort of a, a program in place as my guide did. It wasn't just like we just sat in a room and ate a bunch of mushrooms and MDMA. It was like, no, here's what we're going to do. This song plays, you lay down, you talk at this time, you don't talk at that time. I'm going to do the bells and the drums and the whole thing. And it was a very holistic, um, integrative experience. It wasn't just like, oh, I took a psychedelic and I'm sitting here, you know, and I think that's why I had such a beautiful, healing, profound experience from it. So I'm curious as to whether or not that will develop as a, you know, a more common practice ceremony with the LSD, because I think it could be really useful in that context. I think it will. I've heard of, uh, well, there's Burning Man, A, eh? and then, <laughs> which is sort of just like a giant ceremony. Um, I've heard of a, a LSD shaman or two, which of course uh, made me really uneasy but but to note that there is a desire for a human to frame an experience around taking the substance um says that that yeah that there's a trend to do that so it'll be interesting to see what happens indeed um okay let's talk about style okay <laughs> so you your first um company was called what style well i first uh it's called school of style school of style thank you school of style.com and i can't imagine anyone listening would have a use for that particular website but that's the name but of i the think business. it's interesting though <laughs> let me just go i think the evolution is always interesting and sure. and and i'm interested in the notion of style because psychedelics, plant medicine, doing interpersonal work, hopefully ultimately allows you as a person to be more creative, which is ultimately what makes you human, which is ultimately what makes you a unique animal. And and style is a very, I, th- I hear style, I think creative, right? I think, well, that's a creative part of your brain. And then there's this maybe westernized notion that it's like a superficial thing or that only certain, only good looking people can have style. But I don't think so. I'd like to think that we could all evolve into having our own lifestyle, in, you know, <clears throat> and, and, and you've done a lot of work in that regard. So I'd love to know how it's evolved. Sure, I'd be happy to share it with you. So uh, it was totally accidental that I fell into that line of work. Uh, I worked as a fashion stylist in Hollywood for about 17 years. And that just means you dress other people. So it could be just actors for a commercial. It could be celebrities on a red carpet, models in a print uh, ad or models for an editorial, music videos, tours, etc. Like anytime anyone needs to get dressed to sell a product or service or a piece of art, there's usually someone there to dress them. And that was my gig. I never set out to do that. I just um, had a stroke of luck and fate. Uh, When I first got sober, I was unemployed and unemployable and was homeless. And so through a strange course of events and grace, um, was able to start assisting an old friend of mine uh, who was a big stylist. And After working for her for a couple of months, um, she booked Aerosmith as a client. And there I was like just rocketed into, you know, this new industry. And then we just went on to kind of learn from there and assist other people and eventually do my own thing. But yeah, for many years, how I paid the bills was going out, getting clothes, putting it on someone, which is a lot of things, one of which being creative. And, um, even though I just did it for work at first and it wasn't really something I was terribly passionate about because I also only saw fashion and clothing and in all of that from the perspective of ego and the perspective of uh, elitism and grandiosity and just ego shit, you know? So it was like, oh, fashion people, gross. Like I like real people, you know? That's kind of how I felt about it. But then I started to really... You know, I got honestly, I got better budgets. And so I started working with a lot of designer clothing. And, you know, you get a box full of couture gowns from Paris sent over. I mean, it's a different experience than going down to Target and like wearing some microfibers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I started to really get into the art of it. And as much as I could make myself interested in it so that I was great at my job. So I had to find some passion. And that's when I found kind of the, the non-superficial, non-vapid side of dressing oneself in creative ways or the value in dressing someone else and that um, clothing does inherently 
Well, it does a number of things, but one of the main things I think it does is it communicates something not only to people from the outside, but it also communicates something to you from you. And I know this is true because there have been numerous studies as to how people behave when they're dressed different ways. In other words, if you put, and I'm, you know, I can't name the study, but the premise of it is this: if you put a guy in, you know, some stained old tracksuit and send him out into the world to look for a job or a date or whatever, uh, even if his belief system doesn't support the idea that he's a loser because he's wearing that, he's going to feel like a loser because mm. it's just energetically you look down and you're like, oh shit. Put that same guy in a three thousand dollar you know, suit, and then the game changes. So there's a psychological effect on us subjectively, depending on how we look. So that's from a healthy standpoint. And then it also has a way of communicating uh, tribally speaking to the world when you go out and interact with the world, whether in person or on social media, what you're into and what your belief system is and what your um, social leanings are and the type of art you like and music you likely like. And it gives people an indication as to what tribe you're in or what tribe you want to be in and thus makes people feel um, included or excluded based on their receptivity and compatibility with that archetype. And so it really is a way of communicating. And when I was a kid, I really needed to communicate to the other kids in school that I did not like them, that I didn't want to be friends with them. <laughs> and there was like maybe three other little stoner kids that I wanted to chill with. And I did that with my Ozzy Osbourne shirt and my like Motley Crue yeah. bandana. And, you know, like that was my little Hesher rocker identity that told the world, like, I smoke weed, I listen to metal. Don't fuck with me if you're a jock or a preppy. <laughs> <laughs> Those were because the archetypes were much more simple back then. You know, you didn't have all these subgroups of uh, of archetypes, but it really was my first kind of communication. And so, who would I meet? I would meet other kids that were into rock and roll and smoking weed and riding skateboards, and that was how we told each other where we belong. And so, I think um, even from a healthy perspective, there is some value in caring about how we look, having some sense of um, not a core self-worth, but just it's like a self-care practice of combing your hair and like grooming and cleaning your damn teeth and staying relatively fit. It's like putting on something that presents yourself in a way that is looks like you put some care into it, at least a little bit. Um, it does something energetically to you and also to the people that you encounter. So I think from a healthy perspective, based on how visually artistic one is inherently, that there is some value in representing ourselves through our clothing. On the egoic, more superficial side is the ego identity of I'm worthy because my shirt says this and I have this label on and I have this type of car and those obvious like, you know, very Hollywood materialistic agendas and the influencer world of social media of, you know, all of the paid outfit posts. And there's this aspirational hierarchical, um, if that's the word, um, um, elitist kind of system based yeah. on designer names and, and and all of the superficiality of it, which is, of course, unappealing to most of us that are somewhat conscious. Uh, but we all play the game a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, I am mad at the fact that I drive a BMW. I feel cooler when I pull up somewhere yeah. than... Would Gucci's in, cool, uh, man. Gucci's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, if I if I pulled up in a Toyota, like my whole self worth now at this point in life is not going to be based on that. But sure. I would probably be like, shit, BMW would be doper. You know, it's like I'm not. Well, because then playing. it's about the design. There's the aspect of high design, whether it's a car, or clothes, or a house that costs more because of the effort and bandwidth put into creating that. We've sort of lost that that point a little bit. Um, especially Very as well like, stated. yeah, yeah, especially as Chanel. I mean, Chanel used to be handmade. Okay. Um, they used to give a shit. <laughs> and now that it's the behemoth that it is, you can walk in to a Chanel and Soho, which I've done many times and they'll show you something from a drawer and it's packed in bullshit plastic. It's got like a funky tag on it with no thought put behind it. And it's not, it's not, for the most part, no longer really leather, um, if you like that kind of thing. And so you're like, you're paying for the name. You're paying for the super, superficial part of it. You're not paying for the, the human effort and art, artistry that went behind it. Um, yeah. 
That's true. And, you know, it's funny at, uh, I, you know, as I said, I had that realization when I started working with more luxury goods, I realized, oh, this stuff has a different energetic quality to it. Uh, there is more care put into the design and the manufacturing and the materials. And uh, it's it's something that we would teach our students at School of Style, which is a business that I started, uh, wow, in 2008, 11 plus years ago or so now, uh, to teach people how to be a fashion stylist or a personal stylist. And I've had that business just percolating over there for the past four years that I've been doing this with, my, with myself and my brand. Uh, but we would teach our students that hadn't been you know, brought up in a way where they had access to luxury goods, we would tell them like, just go over to Barney's, which sadly doesn't exist anymore, mm -hmm. but go to Barney's and just touch everything, try things on, like feel what it's like to, to interact with high quality goods. And so you have that, um, that truth. And then also oftentimes a t-shirt is $500 because it says Givenchy and that shit is worth $10, just like every other t-shirt. You know, so there's always two sides to that and the, you know, the status symbol element of it, which is, you know, embarrassing at a certain point of awareness. Um, although some of us, you know, if we really were honest, we would admit we still succumb to that side of it, myself included, from time to time. But there is the artistic side, there is the value and the craftsmanship, the design. And then there's also the bullshit side that because you have something material, you're now... Um, in a in a higher class than someone who doesn't have that same material. And that part's obviously dumb, but we can hopefully outgrow that and then just appreciate good art for good art. Yeah. And and it really it comes back to intention, doesn't it? So the intention you put into what how you're dressing yourself or or what you drive or how you drive or how you style your house or the art that you hang on your walls. Um, or even in a psychedelic realm, the intention that a um, a shaman or a facilitator will put into their performance and how they're projecting the style of the journey that they're about to guide somebody through. And that's kind of, that's where I was going with this, that like, you know, style is cool. It's cool to think about style and branding. And I mean, that's why I started Delic was because there was, well, I had many, many years of experience with the plant matter itself and then um, were in front of a lot of really amazing research being done at the collegiate academic level. But the translation of that information was not, and this is just two years ago now, it's like already opened up. But, um, you know, most people don't read single space, uh, you know, uh, eight point uh papers on psychedelic research. So we have to like filter that information. And, and, and so it all comes down to style, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And that's, I think why nature, you know, if you go out into nature and you look at um, some of the things we consider the most beautiful, like flowers come to mind, uh, there's a design in flowers that has purpose and uh, creation made flowers smell and look beautiful to attract bees and other animals, right? And so um, nature is the ultimate artist and that's where you see design matters. Then why is it, why does it exist in nature? Why doesn't everything just look like the surface of the moon? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Just flat, drab, matte, lifeless, colorless, static, you know, life is abundant. Life is beautiful and, and abundant. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, you know, as humans, we're given gifts and we have the ability to make a space beautiful or make a hat like you have on beautiful to make things look appealing to the eye. And, and then some of us are more, I think some of us are also more sensitive to those. That's a dope ass hat though. For uh, shout out to Mishka here in Venice. He takes sort of existing hats from cattle ranches or whatever and he just makes them his own and he it's a real vibe and he puts a lot of effort and love and i love that i do too yeah um so yeah so you know we watch nature produce things that are attractive and uh, we can do that ourselves and then what i was saying was that um some people are just more sensitive to that than others. You know, I have friends and they just, I go, hey, does this look right? I'm hanging a picture. And they're like, well, it looks the same everywhere you do it. I'm like, no, oh, dude, over here, it's a little off center. You know, it's just some people have that. Like my husband, of, Matt, yeah. Some have that acuity and some don't. Like my my dad's kind of like that. He couldn't, I mean, you could hold up a Basquiat and a, you know, like a, a two-year-old's droppings on a diaper and he would not be able to tell the difference. You know, he can't tell if a song is uh, in key or not, or, you know, like if a song is, 
catchy or not. You know, he just doesn't have an artistic framework. He has a different kind of brain. And so I think some people are less affected by energy. Those of us that are, are kind of cursed because everything has to look pretty and pretty is expensive. So we have to work really hard <laughs> to have an aesthetically vibey environment like my studio here. I could have just had a white ass Good wall job, right there man. It's beautiful. and two plastic folding chairs. And some people would be like, that looks awesome. I just couldn't have it. I have to dial it in because it makes me feel good to look at it, you know? Yeah, it's it's expensive and never finished in my experience. Yes, never finished. blessing and the curse of us creatives, yeah. Well, um, before we finish, I, you're a super biohacker. You are just biohacking the way, your way through life lately, it seems. It's really um, cool to watch and consume what you're doing. So talk about, like, what are some of your newest hacks and especially relevant to quarantine, which I'm sure you're answering a lot of questions like that lately, but I'm curious to know myself. Sure. Well, in regard to the uh, corona drama, I <laughs> I haven't had a real clear picture of what exactly is going on. <laughs> so my arsenal of suggestions, I don't, I don't think until I've, I finally did today, actually this morning, uh, do an Instagram post uh, on the Wanderlust account because I was doing a takeover there. And so I did some, you know, kind of a Dharma talk and did a breath work and meditation thing. And then I thought, well, what would I do right now in real life? And I would go do all my machines and all the biohacking. So I did a live of that. So it's really fresh in mind. Uh, and when I did that, I realized like, oh, no, I am actually doing a coronavirus protocol right now. It's just all stuff essentially that I would be doing all the time anyway. Exactly. Just for my immune system. So uh, in light of what's going on, here's what my top re recommendations would be. Um, you know, according to like what I like, and I'll say that, that everyone's different and depends on what's available to you. But uh, I've been stepping up my ozone gas uh, treatments. So I have an ozone generator at home, which I uh, put in a stethoscope and put it in my ears. I also, and don't do this at home, kids. Right. I also put it up in my sinuses. You have to take a big breath, hold your breath, let the ozone in and blow it all out without inhaling any because you can't inhale ozone. So the breath hold then up the nose is the way I'm doing it just for anyone listening, but that can be super dangerous. So just want to put that out there. And then rectal ozone. And this is stuff I'm doing all the time just to keep um, essentially uh, keep more oxygenated because ozone treatments of different types include uh, or increase your ability to absorb oxygen and utilize oxygen. So there's that. Then there's the antimicrobial element. It's just like a really great sort of natural antibiotic. So I do ozone all the time, but especially right now. And now I even like give it to my girlfriend. She, she'll only go for the ears <laughs> for the record. Yeah. <laughs> all the, the uh, rectal is fun though. I've yeah, done coffee been, enemas that way too. And it's yeah. She's not, she's not about that life quite yet. Um, <laughs> But uh, she's she's staying well. So yeah, the ozone has been huge. Uh, another one that's really useful in a time like this is actually making your own colloidal silver. And you know, some of the things you can get at the health food store are real. Some aren't. There's a lot of like fake news when it comes to colloidal silver. A lot of it's bullshit. And um, also, when it comes to colloidal silver, there are some experts now that are saying it's not a good idea to ingest it because you're putting conductive metals in your body. And now that we have three, four, five G blasting us in most major cities, um, you probably don't want to put excess metal in your body. I still drink a little bit of the colloidal silver, but really what I like to do with it is gargle. Uh, I put it in a nose spray and then I put it in eye drops. And this is to, you know, just essentially um, stop the proliferation of any bacterial, fungal, viral infection. So the colloidal silver is awesome, but you can make it out of distilled water for like zero cents a gallon um, by getting something called the soda silver pulser. The, the pulser um, that's spelled S O T A, soda silver pulser. And I think they're probably two or 300 bucks and they come with these little silver rods. You put it in a jar full of distilled water. And uh, in the course of a couple of few hours, you have a huge jar of colloidal silver. And that's just great stuff to keep around in general. So I love that. Um, and then um, I have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber now in the yard. I recently had a brain scan with uh, Dr. Amen and revealed that there were some circulation problems in different spots of my brain. And mm -hmm. I suspected I was a little dim-witted. <laughs> wanted to step that up. So after pricing individual 
you know, chamber treatments, which I've done off and on for many years, uh, it was actually more cost effective to just buy a chamber myself so I can do it every day. And so I've been doing that for a while and that's just been amazing. The hyperbaric chambers are incredible for cognitive health and jet lag recovery. Um, if you have a bad night's sleep, really good for that. So they're just, they have a lot of uses and are just a good tool to have access to. Even if I think even if one just goes to a clinic here or there and, you know, once a year you go do three sessions in a week or something like that, it's probably a really good anti-aging strategy. But in terms of what's going on right now, I'm using that. Also using a device called the biocharger, which is a combination of a few different energetic technologies. It uses um, photonic energy through uh, noble gases. Uh, it uses a Tesla coil and a PEMF that are able to be tuned to certain frequencies in the rife um, spectrum as they're most commonly known. And so that can be used to increase energy, to settle your nervous system, to neutralize pathogens, et cetera. They even made a recipe right now called the Wuhan, uh, the Wuhan, you know, program or app or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done that one yet, but, um, but I love the biocharger. It's, it's a heavy hitting uh, biohack. And then infrared saunas, I have a clear light sauna been doing infrared saunas forever and um, now have an ice bath in the backyard made out of a Sears chest freezer. Uh, if people want the plans for that, you can find it. Uh, just Google Google Luke Story um, ice bath and a post that I did with Ben Greenfield will come up because he asked me for my kind of protocol and put it in his new book, Boundless. And uh, it's also a blog post. But I have like a badass looking chest freezer ice bath in the backyard. So between the sauna and that, um, and then the um, the red light therapy, which I have in the same room in the backyard, I do that just about every day. I have one here in the office, one panel, and um, the brand that I use is Juve, J-O-O-V-V, -V, uh, just based on the fact that they seem like the best one out there. Um, so yeah, those are, those are kind of the things that I'm into now. And... Um, I, I really feel an, an amazing level of energy. My immune system's really strong. I mean, I also do oregano oil right now, more yeah. than oil. and also the Sir Thrival uh, colostrum for oh, immune. I love all oh, the Sir Thrival yeah. colostrum is like one of the best products out there. It is. Ever. Yeah. I'm buying it like the, I think it's the five kilo big buckets. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like 500 bucks or something, but it's, it, it should last me longer because you really don't need as much as I'm taking, but especially right now. And it's so delicious. I have an excuse. So I think that's kind of my pandemic package is, is all of those things combined. And, you know, for some people, they won't have access to a sauna or the red light therapy. So you put just, ice in your hot tub or in your uh, bathtub. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, just point being is sometimes you might have to find like a spa or a clinic that has some of these tools if, you know, if you don't happen to have them at home. And the same goes for ozone. You know, you can buy your own ozone generator. There's a couple that I believe that are are the best in the market. I link to them on my site. Mine's like kind of a garage made little funky one, but it's safe. I had it tested, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't know where to tell people to buy it. But you can Google like ozone treatments or ozone clinic and in any mid to large size city and probably find someone that can do it for you. And if that starts to add up and get expensive and you like the results, you can just get your own generator and learn how to use it. They're between a thousand and three thousand dollars and like they're pretty much gonna last you the rest of your life. So those are kind of the things I'm working with right now that help me to feel very safe and fortified and that said, I do spray alcohol, you know, rubbing alcohol on my hands when I, after <laughs> my Amazon packages come and shit. I mean, I'm I'm taking some precautions that I wouldn't normally just because the official story is so murky. So murky. We just don't really have any idea what's going on. So I'm erring on the side of cautions. Should it Why be not? a biological weapon or it's like part of the 5G chemtrail like onslaught? Who knows what the hell is going on? So I'm, I am erring on the side of caution a bit more. But those are the biohacks right now that I'm using. Love it. And yeah, guys, we can. Um, I talked to Dr. Matt Cook about ozone. He uses it a lot up in his uh, practice in San Jose, but he talks about it a bit on, I think, episode two of Ask Dr. Cook. Luke, you're the man. I really am so grateful uh, for you taking time to do this for Delic Radio. And uh, we can't wait to see you at Me Delic come hell or high water. I am producing that show. If it's, if it's at a Hollywood studio, it's at a Hollywood studio, but that it's happening August 8th and 9th. 
Well, I'm stoked, man. I can't wait. And I and I trust that we'll be through the bulk of this by then and things will normalize. You know, everything is cyclical. And so we're riding a wave of hysteria and propaganda and God knows what right at the moment. But it can't go on forever because eventually that wave's going to settle and we'll deal with whatever repercussions present themselves at the time. But I'm, I'm stoked about your event, like more than I have been about others because I get to explore some topics that I think are not only really exciting to me, the ones we've just discussed primarily regarding recovery and um, psychedelics and all that, but conversation that's not happening a lot. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of tackle this one um, due to the fact that it's nuanced and, um, and difficult to just do broad strokes on, which excites me. Yeah, amazing. Um, everyone listening, go check out Luke at lukestory.com. He's got a YouTube channel. He's super prolific on social with a ton of amazing content. LukeStory.com. Luke, thank you, my friend. 